why do you think that the Mexican cartels are interested in putting fentanyl into the drugs? Is it simply just money? Is it simply that it's easier to package and cross the U.S. border? Is there, you know, is more motivation behind the scenes? You had an interesting conversation in the book with Jelly Roll, and I, I love the name, by the way, but he highlighted how every drug dealer in his mind felt remorse because they knew that this was going to be killing somebody, someone that they supplied to, you know, would evidently die. When you look at the fentanyl trade, a lot of people are dying. And when those are your customer base, I just can't imagine that they look at it as this long-term economic opportunity to continue to supply the U S you know, it's, I feel like it would eventually hurt the bottom line, you know, and overall it feels the amount that they're actually putting into these drugs as well. You know, eventually it'll create kind of a ne negative feedback loop. So what is the motivation there? Is it, is it simply just money or is you think there's, there's other aspects to it? So yeah, Jerry Roll is a very interesting character, a, a dealer who was, was a drug dealer in Baltimore uh, and sold heroin and crack um, and felt guilty because he was like, now I think he was being generous by saying every drug dealer, or maybe he was talking about the drug dealers there for where he's from. I think he knew that he was kind of poisoning his own community so that he kind of, you know, thought back and, you know, what he described when he was at high school um, and suddenly he could be like earning thousands of dollars every week. And like, why well, go to high school? You know, they're like, they're, these are the, you know, they're like 17 years old and they're like going to you know, nightclubs and they got buying all buy brand new clothes and, and, and having girlfriends who are in their twenties and you know, they kind of living this, but then they're selling drugs, which are poisoning their own community. So then later on in life, he feels some guilt about that. Um, I don't, I don't think – I think if you look at people like Los Chapitos, um, they're pretty cold. Um, they're not really – they're, they're pretty far away. Now, some of them, interestingly, will ban – I mean, I think the Chapitos will ban selling fentanyl inside their communities in Sinaloa. So when they see their communities in Sinaloa, in, in Mexico, they're like, we don't want to sell fentanyl to our own friends, kids and stuff. And But when this stuff's going up, to a different country and they're kind of separated from it. So I think they kind of cut off. And plus, like I described earlier, the brutality of Mexican organized crime is like, you know, it's like, you know, you, you, you gotta be, you can't be too generous in this game. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be cold. You gotta be very aggressive. I think they're motivated by money. It's logistically the profits. So be like, I talk about like we, we, with, you know, with cocaine was massive money. But cocaine still, you know, you do things like, okay, cocaine, uh, you, you buy it from the Colombians and it might sell for $2,000 a key. But then you've got to move it all the way from Colombia up to Mexico and then it you know, gets sold in Mexico for for like 10000 a key. And then you flip it over the border and sell it for like, you know, just flip it over the border, sell it for 15000 a key and then it kind of move it through the United States and it gets twenty five thirty. So you, you invest money, get money back. You know, you're making big money. But so this stuff you buy, you know, buy – thousand dollars worth of chemicals flip them to a million dollars profits insane that's what's really motivating them but also like you then avoid so many different parts of the process so when they make heroin you've got a bunch of people growing opium poppies you've got a long process they've got to plant the poppies they've got to wait several months and then harvest the poppies then you've got, they're in the mountains, they're obviously the Mexican military can go there, or can, you know, it can burn them down, or it can go there and say, well, give us some money and, and we'll let you keep these poppies. Um, then you've got to process them, you know, thing, and then, and then move, move them, and they eventually become the, 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 and it's quite bulky. Fentanyl, don't worry about that. All you've got to do is just get an order and get some precursor chemicals or some finished fentanyl from China, from Asia, and then bring it in. If you make sure it comes in a container. It's way smaller. It's, nice. it's an interesting uh, thing about the logistics of this. Marijuana, okay, old school marijuana is massive. You know, these, these big marijuana bus. You know, you, you, some of them may some bus, they fill up a football stadium with the amount of marijuana they busted. You know, huge amounts. Uh, you know, uh, cocaine, it, 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 it's a lot smaller, but it's still these bricks of cocaine, the big bus, huge places, heroin, smaller still, and then like fentanyl, little chemicals. You could just stash... You know, you could have, um, you know, this, you know, a glass full of fentanyl. It's enough to kill millions of people. You stick that in a car, stick that in a, you know, in a gas tank of a car. So, you know, this stuff now, it's kind of like, 
how are they going to stop this? I mean, it's kind of game changer. It kind of throws off, you know. They're trying now. They're saying, well, we've got to, we've got to admit it's got to clamp down. It's, let's see how this plays out. But the, the scale of it. So I think just logistics and money, the motivation has been. Now, one of the things that perhaps they m- miscalculated or or a consequence of this, and some of these guys are not, I mean, they're cl- the cartels are extremely sophisticated and extremely clever in their operations, and they've grown organically over over decades. But some of the people are not necessarily that forward thinking. So they're just thinking like, uh, you know, they're kind of thinking operationally, bring in product, move product. So but they've also got a million things on their mind. You know, like um, we're dealing with the, you know, the other, you know, the Jalisco cartels fighting us in this territory. We've got to pay off this, you know, they, they've got little things going on. So not necessarily thinking long-term game plan. One thing they perhaps miscalculated or one consequence they're seeing now is the political reaction in the United States has rightfully been big in reaction to fentanyl deaths. So how do we, you know, like now they're seeing a reaction and then they're now they're seeing, you know, new indictments just come out against Los Chapitos. They're like, bring these guys down, bring these guys down because fentanyl. So they're seeing a reaction. Um, but I don't know. It's going to be very interesting in the next few years, um, next few months, next few years, how this plays out. Um, if we continue seeing this, um, or if the the current opioid ep- epidemic is going to kind of burn itself out in the United States, and you know, if you have one hundred seven thousand people dying in a year, is that less people, to, less addicts now? I don't know. I mean, or is it just more people coming? So, do you see some of these kingpins? You obviously were at El Chapo's trial. You've had so much experience, you know, and. The crazy thing about it, it's the kingpins, they come and go. You know, there's only a few that have ever made it, you know, for decades long in the game. Do you think they understand who they are and what role they really play in this? I mean, it, one of the things I see, it's a crazy dynamic. You look at someone like El Chapo, then moves to the Chipitos, the family takes over. There's so much respect and there's so much. You would expect that in such a brutal game, it's constant new people popping up, but there is that level of respect for the family. So you think they understand who they are, like the role they play, what what the impact is that they're having? Um, it's a very interesting question. I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to some of these kingpins, some quite high-level people more recently. And... They, it's kind of sad to say, I mean, they kind of make a pact with the devil, I would say. Um, at some point when they get into this, they kind of make a pact with the devil. And I think they, they, I guess like all human beings, we kind of, we, we're all heroes in our own stories. So they don't see themselves as being villains. They kind of, in their own world as well, got their own kind of motivated with their own ego. Like, who's the best drug trafficker? Who's the biggest drug trafficker? Some of them do literally kind of satanic shit, like um, cannibalism and stuff. But kind of ritualized cannibalism is kind of part of... Um, They... I mean, maybe an old school guy like El Mayo. El Mayo, you mentioned El Mayo a couple of times, and he's, a, he's an interesting character. I mean, El Mayo's hasn't been arrested. <laughs> that guy is going to run, you know, how many hundreds of millions has he made? And he's, was he sitting in some village in Sinaloa still? I mean, kind of old school, um, but he's going to die soon. Um, the kind of big power players now, El Mencho, these guys are pretty brutal. The Chapitos, kind of pretty bit of a power, the new power players come up under them. Um, in terms of how they see themselves, I mean, you know, it was going back to the Knights Templar. You had a, a character there, a kind of kind of Colonel Kurtz character from, from Heart of Darkness or Apocalypse Now, um, where he kind of, uh, you know, had this power and, and, and then he was supposedly killed and then he kind of, rec- you know, he walked around in white robes and people thought he was a ghost. And he wrote his own Bible and kind of, you know, made people kind of learn his words and kind of got, you know, complete ego state. So you get kind of some cases like that or going back to Pablo Escobar. So I did, well, you know, I want to be a politician and I'll be a president. Or something. Um, 
it, they're interesting. I mean, they, they are people who you know have come from from below, and 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 and, and are smart, talented, driven people um, who who have kind of created these these kind of power structures. Um, some of them, you know, the ostentatiousness. Um, you know, they they you know they're going to have a. Some of them are just you know, it's just about women. I mean, they just you know like they just. Um, they're like they're like kind of how you imagine some rock and roll stars or kind of rap stars behave. You know, I'm going to sleep with a million women and 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 and, and have nice cars and just kind of live that kind of moment. Um, pure kind of hedonism. Um, I don't know if they they really if it's somebody who's really seen himself in a kind of political or I mean uh, Nasario Moreno was the the, the nice guy who try and be like philosophical and he had this. Kind of number two was a guy called Latuta, who was a school teacher. Um, and so he was a kind of more of the educated bad guy. And he had kind of saw themselves as being these kind of heroic. Sometimes they seem to spend heroic figures, like kind of they'll compare themselves to like Pancho Bia's Zapata type figures. Seems kind of a rebellion. And if and if Pancho Bia was alive today, he probably would be he probably would be some like major narco, to be fair. Um but like uh yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of weird anti-heroes. And, uh, my second book, Gangster Waters, particularly loose of the kind of profile, is kind of weird anti-heroes. They're kind of mix of um, uh, CEOs of companies mixed with paramilitary re- leaders mixed with rock stars. It's kind of the kind of weird place they have in society. Um, it's kind of scar, you know, that figure of Scarface. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's a kind of... Yeah, they're, they're pretty crazy. They're pretty crazy figures in society, but... but uh, um, I, I I don't I I don't think they they really. I, I mean, it, it was a weird discourse by this actress called uh, Kate de Castillo, who who, who helped uh, coordinate a meeting between Sean Penn and, and Chapo, and she wrote she played this role of a kind of drug trafficker and had this kind of long rant of like, oh, you need to traffic with love, and I trust you more than the government. And this kind of idea that kind of drug traffickers could gain a consciousness. And kind of be a solution, kind of sit down, and I, I wouldn't really put my hopes in that. Uh, sometimes some of them can, you know, some of them have got hearts and can show mercy, and they are powerful people. But like that, they can really going to kind of be some solution to this problem. I, I, don't, I don't really see that. Mm-hmm.